Welcome to another edition of Office Hours with State Representative John Hampton. I'm delighted to uh, welcome you to another uh, special edition. Um, we have a terrific guest today, a leader uh, in the state and the country for gun violence prevention. And uh, I've been delighted to work with him over the years. And I wanted to welcome uh, Jeremy Stein from uh, Connecticut Against Gun Violence, CAGV. Welcome, sir. Um, thank you for joining us here today. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here today. December 14th, 2012, I had just been um, elected to the Connecticut General Assembly, and I was sitting at a restaurant uh, celebrating uh, my birthday and the holidays and just being elected, and uh, I saw in the uh, bar in the restaurant um, flashes of Sandy Hook and numbers of statistics. And uh, I, it's one of those days that we all remember uh, where we were. And uh, it's as if uh, destiny handed us a summons, uh, a call to action. And I'll never forget uh, that first session and never forget uh, uh, helping and crafting that package. And uh, of course, meeting with the families and passing that uh, historic piece of legislation. Where were you that day, sir? Um, I was in New York, um, believe it or not. Um, I, at the time I was an attorney. Um, I was also a volunteer first responder um, in Newtown. Um, with Newtown Underwater Search and Rescue at the time I was actually the captain of NUSAR. Um, and, um, I remember getting, we have a, uh, at the time we had an, a, uh, an electronic system, you know, for dispatch. Um, and I remember getting the call on my phone, um, that everyone was being called out. It didn't matter what you did, whether you were EMS, police, fire, otherwise, everyone was being called out for mutual aid for a, a shooting at, um, the Sandy Hook Elementary School. Um, at the time, we were having problems with the the the, the Newtown dispatch. Um, there was a brand new dispatcher, I believe. Um, so I remember thinking, "Oh, it's probably just a dispatch problem. Like there was probably a typo." Um, and then and then I called my chief. Um, at first, he said, "You know, it's it's bad. It's really bad." Um, and then I remember him telling me, "Don't come." because there's nothing you can do. So um, I, I had a very good friend, um, very good friends at the time that were first responders. My, one of my friends, Marty, um, was with, um, with um, Sandy Hook um, Ambulance. He was one of the first first responders on the scene. Um, there was just, no, there was nothing to be done at that point. It was too late. Now, tell us about your history your background, um, how you came to uh, become such a powerful advocate uh, on this issue and how you came to Connecticut against gun violence. Sure, um, I, I'm, I'm a survivor of gun violence myself. Um, I, I, my uncle took his own life uh, with a firearm. And, um, uh, but uh, my, my, my work history, um, I, professionally, I'm an attorney. I was an attorney for 23 years. Part of my career I spent um, in, in the court system, in the, the, the um, criminal justice system. I was both a prosecutor in the District of Columbia as well as a public defender. Um, so um, I was around a lot of gun violence, um, prosecuted gun crimes as well as defended people who were charged with gun crimes. Um, I also ran the juvenile drug court um, in the District of Columbia. And so um, we, you know, we were um, involved with a lot of youth that were charged with various gun and drug crimes. Um, so, you know, and District of Columbia at the time was, had one of the highest, um, one of the highest gun death rates in the country, I believe. And, um, and Baltimore also um, was experiencing an extremely high level of, of crime, um, including gun crime. Um, in addition to that, um, I've had 
guns pointed at me when I was in high school. So, um, somebody pointed a shotgun at me and others at waiting at a bus stop. Um, I've lived through the DC sniper. Um, we had, uh, there was somebody that was shot and killed just a block down from my house. Um, and there are other, you know, there were other moments in time, um, including, you know, as you mentioned, Sandy Hook, my wife grew up in Sandy Hook. My mother-in-law worked at the school. Um, they lived right around the corner from Sandy Hook at the time of the shooting. So um, they were deeply af affected by that. Um, you know, in addition to that, I, I also knew Nancy Lanza, um, the shooter's mother. Um, so, um, you know, all of these various factors and, 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 you know, when I tell my story, I know I'm, I'm not alone. And I know there are other people um, that I've come across um, through my job that um, have experienced gun violence um, on an even more intimate level, losing children, um, uh, siblings, parents. Um, you know, I, I've met mothers that have lost not one, but two or three children to gun violence. Um, so, you know, for the last almost five years, um, I dedicated my life to to making sure that we do everything we can to reduce gun violence in the state of Con Connecticut and, and around the country. Now, when did you come to CAGV? Um, when did I come to CAGV? Yeah, I started um, working for C CAGV um, in um, on in, in 2017, actually. Uh, my very first day on the job uh, with Connecticut Against Gun Violence was the Las Vegas shooting, was the um, the highest casualty of any mass shooting in the country. Um, so that was that was a, a, a rude awakening to gun violence on my first day of the job. Most people, you know, they start a job and they, they you know, they fill out forms and they meet the meet their staff and, and other coworkers. Uh, my first day was um, talking to um, survivors of that tragedy, talking to the press, talking to people around the country. Um, one of my very first interviews with Connecticut Against Gun Violence was with the BBC to, to talk about why this is happening in the United States and, and really nowhere else on the planet to the extent that it is happening in the United States. Um, one, one of the things that was mentioned in a public hearing uh, a couple of days ago in the judiciary, you know, they were asking about, you know, the number of guns and the number of incidents and the, the number of, of uh, um, illegal guns versus legal guns. And, and um, there was a um, representative that was trying to make a distinction between legal guns and illegal guns. And the, and the fact remains that, um, if if guns right were if if legal guns or legal gun owners um, made a difference um, in reducing violence as a whole or reducing crime, um, if the number of guns that we had in the United States m m meant that we were safer, then we would be the safest country in the world because we have more guns than any other country in the world. We have more gun owners than any other country in the world. And that's simply not true. We also have more gun violence than any other country in the world. Is CAGV a national uh, organization? It's obviously Connecticut against gun violence, but is there a, a national organization that you're a chapter of? Or are you no, we are strictly a state organization. We Our mission is pretty simple. It's to end gun violence in the state of Connecticut. And we have chosen to remain as a state level organization because we feel and we know from evidence that um, we are the most effective way to reduce gun violence is at the state and local level. Um, we can affect a lot of change at the state level, thanks to people like yourself and other legislators that really want to make a difference in, in making us safer and to enact common sense gun laws. Um, there, there has not been the same kind of influence at the, on the national level. Um, there has not been a significant, um, gun bill that's been passed in the last decade. Um, you know, they, and it's not for lack of trying, there've been bills that have passed in the Senate and the, excuse me, in the house. Um, they've tried to pass something as simple as universal background checks with they've, which they've been unable to pass. Um, and, um, you know, there is, um, you know, they are making um, 
progress, but it's it's not even clearly enough. It's not quickly enough. And so, um, you know, it's got to be very frustrating. I know it's frustrating when I talk to advocates around the country. Um, but um, we we know that the the way to end gun violence is on a state and and possibly a municipal level. A lot of change can be made at the state level. A lot of laws um, can be passed, and effective laws can be enforced at at, um, at the local level. But that's not to say that we're not involved um, at the national level. We are um, intimately involved. We do work with a lot of national organizations, such as. Um, Giffords, um, Brady, Everytown, Newtown Action Alliance, um, uh, the uh, Community Justice Action Fund, uh, Amnesty International, other organizations um, that that do a lot of great work to to try to reduce gun violence around the country. Um, And we work with a lot of other states. We're also part of an alliance um, called States United um, to Prevent Gun Violence, which is a which is an alliance of about 30 other states that do the same kind of work that we do and and other um, state groups around the country, like um, um, in Massachusetts, Maine, uh, New York, that are are trying to do the same thing that we're doing and um, with with a a lot of success. Are you a membership organization? Do people become a member of your organization? Are you strictly advocacy and so we don't we do not have a um, a membership, you know, like other organizations. Um, you know, I know there are some organizations where, you know, you can pay a fee and become a member. Um, we do have over 100,000 supporters signed up to help us do our work. Um, there are a lot of people around the country um, that and, and in the state of Connecticut that um, help us do this work. We do not do this alone by any means. Um, and, you know, and if anybody wants, who's listening, wants to find out more about our, our our organization or wants to sign up, you can go to our website, www.cagv.org, and you can sign up for emails um, and, and really be, um, you know, engaged in what's happening around Connecticut, um, especially what's happening at the um, at the state um, legislative level, you know, what, and, and one of the best ways that people can be involved is to really know what's going on in terms of legislation. Um, you know, and, and uh, you know, one of the other things that our organization does is that we, we grade politicians, we grade uh, elected officials and um, people running for office in both incumbents and newcomers, um, because we want to make sure, you know, knowledge is power. And we want to make sure that people, understand that their vote matters, um, that, you know, there's one day of the year where everyone is equal. You know, it doesn't matter if you uh, drive a cab or if you're the president of the United States. Um, it doesn't matter if you work in a hospital or you work in a school um, or, you, or, you know, your, or your mother, father or student. Um, your vote, one vote counts for the same as anybody else. And so it is really important um, that people utilize um, that power, um, but they also need to do it in a way that it's an educated vote. And so we feel that it is extremely important to make sure that voters are informed about how their elected officials are voting, especially on gun violence related issues. I'm sorry, John. Your your uh, uh, your 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 audio cut out for a second. How are you funded? Funded? How are we funded? So we are um, mostly funded by donations. Um, you know, we do get um, grants from time to time, um, and but most of our funding uh, comes from you know, as they say, the kindness of strangers. Um, so. Um, we we um, we rely on um, mostly donations for the people who are are um, interested in making sure that they are safe, their children are safe, um, and uh, and and want to make sure that um, there's uh, sufficient uh, you know we have the efficient ability to be able to to do this kind of work. Um, we do employ you know, we have a very small staff. We do employ lobbyists to help us do our work. Um, you know, shout out to Gallon and Robinson, who we believe are some of the best lobbyists, if not the best lobbyists in the state, uh, if not the country. Um, they're, you know, they we're extremely proud of the work that they do, not just with 
with our organization, but with other organizations that are doing great work in the state of Connecticut to um, to uplift um, people uh, and and their rights. And so um, we um, you know we are a very effective organization, but we we you know it it does cost money to do this. Um, and uh, you know, and the other thing to consider is, is, and we tell people all the time, is there are organizations like the NRA, the NSSF, and and the CCDL that. Um, our member organizations that 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 also um, go out and 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 ask people to give them money. They also fundraise for money, and and these organizations like the NRA and the NSSF, um, they have a lot of money, and um, and they use that money um, in, in a way to to buy influence. Um, they get you know the NRA. We all know gave a lot of money. Um, to to buy a president to be able to promote their agenda, which is to try to get as many guns in as many hands and many homes as possible, um, to make you know gun ownership, um, and uh, you know and to make sure that um, that gun research was not conducted, to make sure that that Congress didn't pass any meaningful gun legislation, and that groups like the the CDC and the NIH could not do gun research to, to try to make sure that that we did not know the truth about about gun violence in the United States. So, you know, while you know, while it is important to fund organizations that are doing the kind of work that we do and, it you know, and it doesn't have to be CAGV, it could be other organizations. But it's also, you know, it's also important to understand that that while this is happening. There are other organizations that are working against us and are working against, you know, safety. Now, uh, Sandy Hook, uh, the bill that we passed um, in 2013 was uh, was very comprehensive, and Connecticut's become a, a leader thanks to you and and other advocates in um, gun violence prevention and um, addressing this issue. Talk about some of the other uh, legislation, uh, that the bills that you've worked on since then um, over the years, the successes that we've had, some of the. Sure. Um, so while I've been um, with CAGV um, last year, um, we uh, we worked on and passed, helped pass a bill for the extreme risk protection order, um, which is probably one of the most important laws that any state can have. Um, Connecticut invented that law. The extreme risk protection order is a law that enables um, the court to take action um, and to be able to, to allow the police to remove guns only in the most extreme circumstances where someone is at risk to themselves or others and that that owns a firearm and that just won't give it up. Um, and really, we're not you know, we're not talking about um, removing the guns from legal gun owners who are, you know, who are who are, you know, up, who are, you know, who are following laws and are safe. And, are, you know, like this has nothing to do with that. What this has to do with is people oftentimes with um, mental health disorders that you know, and not just any mental health disorder, a mental health disorder where they are either contemplating suicide of taking their own life or they're they they have made threats in which they've said they're going to shoot other people or sh you know enter a school and shoot a lot of people commit a mass murder um you know and where the police have and family members have done just about everything they could and then the only option is to be able to remove the guns to save lives and and we know it works we know for every I believe that you know for every 10 times this is used we know that at least one life is saved um so this is a very effective law um last year we worked on it um you know in a bipartisan manner to be able to strengthen that law to expand that to allow that to be accessible to um not just the police to, but but to family members um and as well as mental health providers um to be able to make sure that um you know gun Ownership isn't creating, um, you know, more tragedy in in this state. Um, other things that we've worked on, you know, very, you know, uh, once again with bipartisan support, overwhelming bipartisan support, are something as simple as safe storage, right? So safe storage bills. Most gun owners, um, you know, all responsible gun owners believe this. Um, 
is that you should store a weapon when it's not in use, you know, that you should store it in a place that can't be accessed by children, that can't be accessed by people who are prohibited from owning firearms or, or shouldn't have firearms. Um, and, you know, and then to store ammunition separately, um, but to make sure that guns are stored securely, not only just in your homes, but also in vehicles. What we were seeing uh, was that people were leaving their firearms under the front seat of their car or sometimes even in the in the front seat of their car, going to the store um, or leaving guns. We, we, we heard um, an incident of someone leaving an AR-15 in the front seat of their car without locking it up. Um, actually, and actually, this, this was um, an incident that happened um, shortly uh, after the uh, passage of the law, but before, you know, before it went into effect is that someone had left an, a, a, a loaded um, assault weapon in the front seat of their car and then went to sleep and the car was unlocked and someone just lifted the handle. And now this person who was, you know, this criminal who was looking to, to steal, you know, steal things from cars now had a windfall with an, with an assault weapon. Right. And this is, this is something we heard over and over and over again. We know that um, we've heard a lot of increase in, um, in gun theft over the pandemic, sorry, car theft over the pandemic. Um, but you know, what we were also hearing is that people who were stealing cars were also obtaining firearms, um, because people were just leaving them in their cars and, and oftentimes unlocked. And so not only, you know, does this not make any sense, right. But, but also this is increasing gun violence in our cities. We know that guns that are stolen are, have a great likelihood of ending up in the hands of people who are going to not only commit crimes, but commit violent crimes. There was a statistic that um, I read that that 90 percent of all guns that are stolen, uh, you know, are, are likely to be used in a crime. And so this was a way, a simple way to make sure that we reduced, um, you know, a simple fix to 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 look at reducing gun crimes um, and, and and access to guns. Um, so, you know, other things that we've done in the past um, banned uh, ghost guns, you know, uh, unmarked, unserialized, untraceable guns that people were using, you know, felons were, were, were um, making their own guns, people that were prohibited and were trying to bypass our very effective background check system and permit to purchase system. They were making guns in their, in their basement prohibited by, you know, by normally they would be prohibited from having guns. And now they were able to go online and, and purchase gun parts. Um, and then those guns were untraceable. Um, we've seen an, a dramatic in increase in ghost guns around the country. Um, we also prohibited uh, uh, 3D printed guns, plastic guns that could be made that could bypass um, a, uh, you know, a metal detector, <laughs> um, plastic guns that someone could get on a plane. Um, that could bring into the state capital, you know, and so we wanted to make sure that people were as safe as possible, you know, and these are, these are common sense fix to be able to prohibit things, um, you know, like 3d printed guns, um, bump stocks and otherwise. Um, and we're still working on legislation. Can you tell folks about bump stocks? I'm sorry. Can you tell folks about bump stocks? Yeah, I mean, bump stock, as I said earlier, the Las Vegas shooting um, was the the highest casualty for any mass shooting in the United States. I believe it was was either 59 or 58 um, lives were lost in Las Vegas. And that's not including the number of people that were injured. You know, hundreds and hundreds of people were injured during that. And it was a concert. And what happened in that situation was uh, a man, you know, decided that he wanted to kill a lot of people in a short period of time. Um, and what he did was he took a lot of guns, mostly um, mostly assault weapons, AR-15s. Um, and uh, and at the you know what, what in the United States, machine guns are are, are banned. And um, and so you, you um, only under limited circumstances can you either buy or, 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 or possess a machine gun. And but what 
this man did was he bought a very simple device called a bomb stock. And what it essentially does is it takes an assault weapon or a a semi-automatic weapon and it turns it into a functional machine gun. It it basically replicates the same rate of fire as a fully automatic weapon. Um, And it's just a simple device. It's, it's, uh, um, it just allows, um, it allows the um, recoil of the firearm to be used to then uh, assist the, sh- the 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 next round to be fired more rapidly. So this 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 simple device um, enabled him to kill a lot of people very quickly, um, and um, and it was only you know they, they say that it wasn't it was only in the time that he was able to reload or he ran out of ammunition you know if not for that he he would have killed even more people. So this this thing which no one really needs legitimately um, was banned. And, and the reason was it, it is because there really isn't any legitimate use for a bump stock. And it, it was responsible, partly responsible for the, for the number of people that died, not, not the fact that this person was going to kill people, but the number of people that he killed people with. And then the rate he killed people with was assisted by this simple, the simple device. So, so the governor decided to ban it. So here we are in, um, the 2022 legislative session. Um, talk to us about your legislative priorities. Yeah, thank you for asking. Um, you know, while we've done a lot in Connecticut, um, we could be doing a lot better when it comes to reducing gun violence in communities of color. And so, you know, one of the things that um, we need to be doing in Connecticut is to make sure that we are concentrating on uh, on our cities and, and black and brown communities and, the, and community level, reducing community level gun violence. We know this, there is this disproportional effect of gun violence on, on specifically black communities. Um, and, um, and what we are proposing in House Bill 5397 is to create an Office of Gun Violence Prevention. Um, this is something that's being done around the country um, in states and cities um, and to use some of the um, American Rescue Plan funding, but also to make sure that the state is using its own funding to invest in holistic strategies um, that um, and, and a long term um, long term, both in terms of strategy and funding to be able to um, try to solve um, some of the problems that exist um, in our cities and to really invest in our communities. So what we're pr- pr- proposing is to establish an office, but also a grant fund, a grant program to fund organizations that conduct evidence-informed community-based initiatives to reduce gun violence without contributing to mass incarceration. Um, so part of this office would not only be a grant source for those organizations that are doing prevention, intervention and aftercare, um, uh, but also it would be used to collect data on gun violence in Connecticut to make that research publicly available um, and to assist you know, legislators in, in making decisions that are based on evidence to, to utilize the state's funding to, to do the most effective things that we could be doing to reduce gun violence. Um, to study, you know, how how we are investing in these solutions and, and whether it's working, um, to look at metrics um, in in some of the organizations that are doing this type of work, um, to collaborate with researchers, um, but also to provide technical assistance for those organizations, such as um, violence interrupters, um, in, uh, commu- hospital v- uh, violence intervention programs, um, aftercare solutions, you know, survivor organizations to make sure there is proper funding for for organizations that are dedicated to survivors of of of, of gun violence and homicide, um, and you know, and to make sure that we are connecting different agencies within the state of Connecticut that deal with education, housing, mental health, reentry, criminal justice, um, and, and and public health. Um, and especially public health, because this is a public health crisis. So we are proposing that um, this office be housed within the Department of Public Health. Um, and um, and we feel that like that is the best chance um, to make sure that this is addressed as a public health crisis. So I'm proud to be a co-sponsor of that bill. And um, 
Thank you very much. First, um, where where is it now in the process? It, it uh, has it been called for public hearing yet? Um, so. Um, no, it has not. Um, it's it was raised in the public health committee, um, and uh, I'm actually <laughs> I'm getting texts right now, so I'm I'm wondering if they set a date. But my understanding is that is very possible um, that there there may be a date next week that there may be a public. I'm not sure of the date um, yet, but um, I do know um, that um, we're hoping that we're hoping that the, there is a public hearing soon. Um, like I said, we have a lot of support for this bill. It, it just makes sense. You know, there really, there really, other, it, it, there really aren't too many arguments against funding solutions to end community gun violence. I mean, we've seen dramatic increases in gun violence um, in the state of Connecticut um, between, uh, you know, in 2019, between 2019 and 2020, we saw a 50 percent increase in gun homicides in the state of Connecticut. And last year we saw an additional 12 percent increase um, the year, you know, 2018 to 2019. We saw a 19 percent increase um, in places like New Haven and Bridgeport and Hartford. Um, we've seen dramatic increases during the pandemic. There have been years where, you know, and, and weeks and months where things have been better, you know, have been better and, and gun violence seems to have been reduced, but overall there's dramatic increase. And, you know, the, look, while the police are doing everything they can, um, the police aren't the only solution. We cannot just look to funding the police and, and, and increasing the number of police um, and thinking that that is gonna solve the problem. You can't arrest your way out of this problem. Um, and, um, you know, what we need to be doing is investing in communities. We need to be listening to communities, um, which is also part of this um, part of this Office of Violence Prevention. Part of, of 5397 is to create a, um, a an advisory council, right? And that, that is really an important piece of this: is that there should be an advisory council that the Department of Public Health defers to, that is made up of community members that live in these communities, that is made up of of um, people that are doing this kind of work, um, that of experts, of researchers of community leaders, clergy, you know, people that live in the communities that know what the problems are. And I think, I, as I said earlier, you know, gun violence is a, is a local problem and some of these solutions have to be local. And so, it, so in order for us to really um, get to the root of these problems, to really attack the root causes of gun violence, we need to be listening to communities. You had a rally on the 14th. And um, I think I said at that rally, it's so easy for us in to, as legislators to be in our silos and obviously be outraged in suburban communities like Sandy Hook when events like that happen. But we need to be aware that, you know, it's happening more often in our urban areas and that we need to be sensitive to that and uh, uh, support your efforts. Um, because uh, it's easy to it's easy to forget that's happening. Just you know, I live in Simsbury, just a quick twenty minute drive to Hartford, and you know it's a daily daily um, uh, cycle that's happening. And uh, so that's why it's so more much more important for those those of us who live in the, the bedroom communities to uh, to offer our support because it's it's all of our issue and. Uh, yeah, and I and and we appreciate your support, um, Representative Hampton. Um, you know, you've been a champion on this issue for a very long time. Um, we do appreciate all the support um, from from all those people at the Capitol. That you know, and 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 as as you said, you know, we were in a public hearing the other day in Judiciary, and I believe that hearing lasted until two thirty in the morning. Um, and you know, there 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 are people like Steve Stashroom and Gary Winfield and yourself and uh, many, many, many others who, um, who, you know, have always been like great champions on this issue. Um, and, and I want to applaud you also, you'd mentioned this rally that we had on Valentine's day to, to focus attention on the problem of gun violence in our communities. And we had lots of people speak from Hartford and New Haven and Bridgeport and, and Waterbury who had lost children, some people who had, um, you know, that are doing this work, a lot of times they're doing this work while we sleep. And, 
it had to have been the coldest day of the year. I mean, it was probably you know, like 30 below. I believe there was, you know, there's probably like a 40 mile per hour wind, you know, and it was, it was so cold out. And I remember looking at you and you were there from the very beginning to the very end. Um, no gloves on, no hat on. Um, and, you know, I really want to applaud you. And that, you know, and I remember looking at you and thinking like, this is, this man's going to die of frostbite. And, and, but you, you, you know, you told me you, you weren't, you said, I'm not going anywhere. And you felt it was so important to speak about this issue. And I really want to applaud you um, for, for sticking it out and making sure that your voice was heard. And you've always, you know, been someone that has used your position of power to try to help save lives. And so I, I really want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. John, of course, I mean, you uh, yourself, you're doing the, the heavy lifting and the hard work. And it's for us in the legislature to um, uh, to support you and um, take Connecticut to the next level. And um, I'm really uh, excited about getting passage of the um, the gun violence uh, office of gun violence prevention passed. Um, is that modeled on other states? Do other states have that? Yes, um, and um, so it is. It is modeled on on other states, um, and um, you know we kind of took the best pieces from from other states, and um, you know this is something. The idea of investing in community violence, interruption and intervention and creating a grant source. Um, I believe one of the first states to do this was California. They created something called the Cal VIP program. It's been around for years. Um, and, and we're seeing this around, you know, many, many states invest. Um, and, you know, what we're asking for is, is pretty, a pretty modest investment considering what we're we're talking about um and in considering the amount of violence and the amount of lives that can be saved right now you know it is estimated that the cost of gun violence to the state of connecticut every year is about 1.2 billion dollars what we're asking for is at a minimum a five million dollar investment every year in in connecticut um, as a grant source and an additional, um, you know, at least a million dollar investment in the office itself to make sure that they have staff and proper ability to administer these grants. But the majority of the money we think should go towards a grant source to funding organizations that are doing this work in the communities. Um, and, you know, and modeled around the state, the investment per capita that, that, that Connecticut would make is, is really modest compared to what other states are investing. We're seeing investments in other states um, in terms of, you know, 10 million, you know, 90 million, some states we've seen, um, I think even places like New Mexico, I believe just the other day, just a couple of days ago, I think they said they were investing $9 million into gun violence prevention, um, specifically for, um, you know, violence intervention strategies. Um, so, um, you know, there's a, there's a dollar behind me. Um, and, um, you know, the reason why I have that up is the governor had proposed 3.6 um, million dollars um, to invest in in a community violence inter interruption intervention and prevention strategy over the course of two years. Um, and while we applaud the governor for doing this, um, we do think that that should be increased um, because three point six million dollars is only one dollar for every person in the state of Connecticut, and you know one dollar, you know human life, you know the, the cost of lives in Connecticut is worth more than a dollar investment. And so, um, you know, while we applaud the administration for doing that, we should be investing a lot more in, in, in our communities. And so um, that's why we're asking for a minimum of what we are. Um, we think that this is important. And, and like I said, if we invest, you know, $1.2 billion is what we already spend. If we just spent a little bit money in prevention, it could not only save money for the state of Connecticut, um, but it, it will save lives. Um, how, do you, how do you address uh, the naysayers um, that uh, are concerned about their rights? Uh, you know, it's a fundamental right of our system to, to bear arms and, and have firearms. And how, how do you address um, that because I'm often asked that, um, and uh, how does that? Um, how do you address that question um, as you do your work? Um, 
to assure yeah, folks, to assure folks that their rights are protected. And I think it's an it's an excellent question, and I and I think it's a valid, and we get asked that all the time. Um, you know, I pride myself in in, and I said this the other day at, in during testimony is we. We look at legislation every year. We propose legislation that is is um, geared towards having the greatest effect on reducing gun violence, while at the same time making sure that it doesn't have some unintended consequences, which includes people's rights. Um, and so, you know, I I have prided myself. I can say, as an attorney, I have actually defended people's rights. To, to have and use firearms under the Second Amendment. That is something I did as an attorney. And um, um, and so I, I am mindful and, and I, you know, I have I have a permit and I've owned guns in the past. I don't currently own a firearm because I, I, I feel that I am not. I know the data is correct in showing that I am less safe with a gun. Like and that's and, and we want to make sure that it is clear in our organization that we do not want to interfere with someone's legitimate right to own a gun and to be able to make themselves feel safer by owning a gun. But we also want to make sure that people understand the truth. And the truth is that you are not safer with a gun, that the data just does not confirm that, that you are much more likely to have Someone in your family ha use that gun against themselves. Somebody in your family commits suicide with that gun. That somebody will accidentally shoot themselves. That that someone will die from domestic violence, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that you are much more likely that someone in your family, in your home, will die from that handgun than it is that you will use that gun successfully in the defense of your home by some would be intruder, which hasn't happened yet, you know, and it's a hypothetical. The, the, the fact remains that there is really a extremely low chance that someone is going to um, break into your house and that you are going to successfully use a firearm to, to defend, you know, your home against that, that person. It just, it just does not happen that much. You know, it's less than 1%. Whereas if you look at the how many times people are killed accidentally, killed by guns with domestic violence, use guns, commit suicide, having the gun increases those chances of, 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 of having, you know, domestic violence, suicide, accidental death by four, five and six times. Um, so it's much more likely that that gun will 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 cause you more harm it's you know and, and which is the irony is that people people have guns because they believe that it's going to make them safer and it really doesn't so you know so when we propose legislation we we are mindful that um we want to make sure that it's done in a way that it isn't going to uh inhibit um people's true constitutional rights you know but but a constitutional right is not um unlimited you know, and even the most conservative Supreme Court justice has said that it's that it's not a, the rights that we have under our Constitution are not unlimited. And we can never allow the Second Amendment to interfere with any other rights, including the First Amendment. And what we've seen time and time again um, is that firearms have been used to prevent people from voting, from exercising their religious rights, um, from exercising their right to free speech. So, you know, while we oftentimes hear people complain about their, you know, how some of these laws are affecting their ability to, um, you know, to have a gun under the Second Amendment, first of all, it's not true because the courts have upheld every single one of our laws in Connecticut. So it it doesn't affect the Second Amendment. It isn't it isn't limiting their true rights at all. But the other thing we want to make sure is that there's a First Amendment. <laughs> And the First Amendment can never fall at the hands of the Second Amendment. You know, that ha that is a right that needs to be secured just as vigorously as the Second Amendment. Now, um, does CATV go into communities? And I know you do a lot of advocacy, but do you do a lot of education, um, educational programs? Absolutely. So we actually have two organizations, two arms of our organization. We have CAGV and then we also have CAGV Education Fund. And um, 
And we do, um, you know, we go around the state and the country educating people about some of the things that we've talked about today of making sure that people really understand the risk of gun ownership, that people really understand the true facts of, of guns in our country. Um, that guns just don't make us safer, you know. And and like I said, I, I, we do draw a distinction of people wanting a gun because they want to feel safer. But but and we don't want to interfere with someone's right or someone's ability, you know, to to make them feel safer. But we also encourage people to understand the true facts that 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 if you go out and buy a gun, it's really not making you safer. It's actually putting you more at risk. We also educate people on what laws we have in Connecticut. Um, as well as educating, um, you know, organizations, governments, people around the country about what all the great work we've done in Connecticut, what states and cities can do, um, as well as being a resource for for states and cities. We work in, in places like New Haven and Bridgeport and Hartford um, to try to educate um, leaders and commun you know, community members to understand what they can do um, and, and how they can be more involved. Um, recently, there was a settlement um, for the families of Sandy Hook. Um, did you want to comment on that or um, there was a financial uh, settlement uh, it was Remington, I believe, correct? That's correct. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it is. I, I have. It, I, I'm I am happy for the families that that they do not have to deal with that anymore that that there this was a you know it's hard to say it was a victory although it was i it's hard to say it's a victory because there's really no amount of money that you could give these families that could possibly you, you compensate them for the loss that they receive you know you you there is no amount of money that can replace the loss of a child and you just there's just no there's just not enough money in the world to replace that loss for these families um, or for any family that has lost a child if to gun violence. Um, and so uh, I think it, it is, it is an important step to recognize that these, that the gun lobby is, is, um, is, is vulnerable, you know, that, that it is amazing now that we have established something that shows that, that the gun industry can be held responsible for the damage that they've done for the for the extreme loss of life that they've helped to create and um and and that and to hold these companies responsible for negligent practices in the way they do their work you know without regard to safety you know especially around the way that they market firearms and so i think this is going to be i think this is the first of many type lawsuits i'm hoping that in addition to um, holding them responsible, I hope that this might be a way to convince gun manufacturers to be more responsible in, in the way that they manufacture guns and to make sure that, that they not only are concerned about profit, but that they are concerned about safety as well. And to make sure, just as, just as the car industry does, um, that the products that they're putting into the public are as safe as possible. Now, um, are you tracking any other bills uh, this year of interest related to your cause? Yes. Thing? Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of bills out there, um, both good and bad. Um, so, uh, you know, there's certainly the governor's bill, which we're, there was a hearing on the other day in Judiciary SB 16. Um, you know, there is a really, as I, as I stated, you know, there's a, a very important part of that bill that we're concentrating on, which is the, um, the community violence funding portion of that. So we do think that the most important part of that bill is, as, as I've explained, is the funding of community violence intervention and prevention strategies. Um, but there, you know, there are other bills that um, we are looking at as well. Um, there's a, a bill that we've seen many times in the legislature um, that thankfully, you know, thankfully to, to, to people who uh, have common sense like yourself have voted against, um, you know, but there's bills like stand your ground laws um, that, that the conservative right is trying to, to pass in the state of Connecticut. And what we know from those laws around the country, especially looking at places like Florida, 
um, is that stand your ground laws not only increase homicide rates, um, but they do nothing to lower um, crime rates at all. Um, and they also increase um, racial discrimination. Um, and so so a, a dangerous bill like stand your ground will not only increase gun death, it'll increase homicide rates and increase racial discrimination in the state of Connecticut. It is it is a horrible law that has no place in Connecticut. Um, I believe there's some good domestic violence. Um, legislation that's been introduced this year that I'm tracking and obviously domestic violence um, had been on an increase during the pandemic. So I'm sure you're tracking and concerned about those issues as well. Exactly. Yes. Um, you know, there, there's, there, as, you know, as this year, as in every year, you know, it's a short session this year, um, but as in every year, there are a lot of good ideas. There are a lot of legislation. You know, we know there's limited time to pass laws. And so we concentrate on making sure that whatever the laws are that are our priority are going to have the greatest effect of reducing gun violence um, without unintended consequences. Um, and we really do feel that that this year, you know, and, and in previous years, that the most important thing that legislators like yourself can concentrate on in terms of gun violence reduction strategies is HB 5397 and anything that will help us to not only create, you know, a, an office of violence prevention in, you know, in, in the Department of Public Health or, or other agency so that the state at a state level, right, that we can be concentrating on long term strategies to reduce gun violence in our cities um, and to make sure those strategies are funded and, and researched and studied um, so that we have the greatest chance of reducing the day to day gun violence that occurs in our cities. Um, you know, every day, the number of guns, the number of shootings that we have in Connecticut, the number of gun deaths that we have in Connecticut, every day someone die, every day someone is shot with a gun in Connecticut. Every day someone is shot. And every, every other day someone is killed. And most of those deaths are occurring, occurring in our cities. And, and, and many of those deaths are occurring amongst black and brown communities. And we need to, we need to start, um, addressing the violence in those communities. And we need to start um, funding and, and providing resources to those communities that are suffering. And we've seen that suffering only increase during the pandemic, where we've seen a depletion of resources. Um, we've seen you know, uh, uh, strategies that may have been available to, to communities and community centers and things like that and parks um, and after school programs. We've seen those things diminish over the pandemic and, you know, but we need to really be focusing on those types of strategies that will have the greatest effect on reducing gun violence. Now, how can folks um, listening and watching today uh, support your efforts and, and CAGV's efforts? So the first thing that you can do is you can go to our website, CAGV.org. You can sign up for our emails and that will make sure that you are engaged. That'll, you know, and you can, you can let us know how you want to be engaged. Do you want to just receive emails or do you want to actually come to the Capitol and talk to your legislator or um, help, you know, help us, you know, uh, you, you know, help to use your voice on, on dem demanding you know, better uh, laws that will help you and your family um, telling your stories. Um, you know, there's a way, there's many different ways that you can help writing testimony, um, writing letters to the governor and, 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 and your elected officials, um, volunteering, you know, uh, holding meetings in your community. Um, we'll even come to your house um, and, uh, and we'll wear a mask. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's important to point out there are many different ways that people can get involved um, you know, you don't have to you don't have to be marching uh, and testifying at the Capitol if that's not your thing. You can there's very simple ways you can do it. But the first thing you need to do is to is to be engaged. And the best way that you can do that is to sign up um, so that you're getting emails. Um, the other thing you do is go on our Facebook page you can go on our Twitter feed. Um, you can like us on social media um, and, you know, and, and knowledge is power. So if you know what's going on in your community. Um, then you can you can make a change. You can you let your voice be heard. But the other thing is, it doesn't have to just be with us, right? 
there's a lot going on in many communities and there are a lot of organizations that exist that are doing really great work in their communities. And, um, and so it doesn't have to be with us, but get engaged, get involved with a local organization that's going to create change. Um, you know, we can no longer sit idly by this, this problem isn't going to solve itself. And the only way that we're going to be able to, to change this is to get involved and to make our voices heard, um, especially at the polls. You know, I, I, it's, it's so disheartening. And I know you probably feel the same way is, is when, when you see the election results and then you see the number of people that are actually voting, right. You know, and, and you see, you know, rates like 30% or 40%, you know, and, and, and what you realize is, you know, less than half of the people oftentimes in elections are actually making their voices heard. And especially, you know, you look around the world and there are countries where people will wait online for hours and hours and days to, to just vote um, and, and to risk their lives to vote. And, and in this country, unfortunately, we take it for granted. And so we, we feel that one of the most important things that you can do is to make your voice heard, especially on election day. So get out there and vote. And, uh, you know, laws do matter. Well, unfortunately, we're um, running out of time, but I wanted to thank you, Jeremy, for, for joining us on uh, this very special episode and talk to, talking to us about your incredible efforts. I really applaud your leadership and thank you um, for all that you do. Thanks for being with us today. I'm sure our residents here in Simsbury are going to appreciate it and hopefully sign up uh, and, and check out your website. And I'll be alerting folks um, in Simsbury as to uh, when the bill um, gets a hearing for the Office of Gun Violence Prevention. The number again is 52, the bill number is. Oh, perfect. sorry, HB 5397. And it's an act declaring gun violence a public health crisis and establishing the Office of Gun Violence Prevention. Um, and so thank you. Thank you, Representative Hampton, for all your support. Um, let me know if you ever want me back or we can come to Simsbury. And uh, and I know, you know, you know, you and I have been on several panels in the past pre pandemic. Um, yeah, let, let, I'd love to come back. And Simsbury is a, a wonderful community. And uh, we look forward to talking with you all. We'll do it in warmer weather. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and we'll get you some gloves, John. <laughs> seeing you here at the Capitol and uh, wishing everybody, all of us a successful session. It's a short session, as you know, and it's all compacted. So hopefully we get a lot done in the next uh, week, few weeks. It's, it's, it's going quick. Um, but thank you. And um, thank you everyone um, in Simsbury for tuning into uh, another episode of Office Hours with State Representative John Hampton. And um, we'll see you next time. Thanks, Jeremy. Take care. Bye-bye. See you, everyone. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.